Next, I'm thrilled to welcome Ann Duncan and Greg Godbout, two incredible leaders who I got to know during our time working together in government. Ann is now the Chief Information Officer of the County of Santa Clara in California. She served in the Obama administration as the Chief Information Officer in the US uh, EPA. And Greg and Ann worked together at EPA, where Greg was the CTO. Before that, Greg was a co-founder of 18F and also served as its first executive director. Uh, Greg is now the Director of Digital Services at Fearless, uh, where he's responsible for business development. So today, Greg and Ann will talk to us about the history and culture of the digital services movement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Greg. Hello. It's a long time since I've seen you. I know. I know. We're on different coasts. I know. So, but, you know, I, I went, you know, I'm going to California. I went in before this trip, went to the back of my closet, got a suit out. Yes. You know, came here, put it on, and guaranteed, you're still in blue jeans and a t-shirt. God, I love that. <laughs> you could have just gone blue jeans and a t-shirt. I could have. I'm thinking about getting the blue jeans back out of my suitcase. So if after lunch I'm wearing something different, you'll know why. Ann and I had a wonderful time. Or at least I think it was wonderful. Maybe it wasn't wonderful for you. But I a wonderful time working at EPA. And and uh, a little background on it. it. Just for me, going there, um, it, it was, and we're going to talk a little bit about the future of, of digital services and, and Agile, but uh, it, it got, it was the first exposure to like, how do you do this at the enterprise level? And we'll sort of get there at the end, but it mm -hmm. was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, so let's start at the beginning. So how did you get involved in digital services? How did it start for you? Uh, for me, it was, uh, I was fortunate enough to get selected as a Presidential Innovation Fellow. I, I was mentioned Office of Science and Technology Policy under Todd Park. I had created the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. Uh, we were housed at GSA. I was what we called the second round at that time when I came in. And I was put on a team with Aaron Snow, who's in Canada as well. Um, and uh, we were working on um, uh, basically innovation in acquisitions and stuff. So while there, Jen Pauka from Code for America had come in to both run the program, but really set up what uh, was inspired by the government digital services in um, the UK, so GDS in the UK, and, and which they were trying to set that up here in the US. So that was my first exposure to the idea of like a, a digital services office or something like that. I thought it was a, a great idea. And then healthcare.gov happened, and uh, you know, suddenly my mom was asking me about Agile, my cousin, <laughs> and uh, Agile was like the thing, right? And it was very exciting. And uh, from there, I went to. Um, uh, there was actually, I'm not letting people know this, but within the Obama administration, even before I got to government, there were several attempts to set this up, and at least three that I'm aware of, and we were the fourth attempt, and uh, it, became, it was called GovX. It had many different names, but eventually it was 18F. And then working with the White House and the group, that by the, we were launched in March, and by August, uh, U.S. Digital Services was launched. And um, so for me, it was, I got exposure to this, this, this sort of civic hacking community that was already in and around and and that cultivated and so there's we talk about code for america but like we gathered all these people from all these different places so cfpb for example we hired a ton of people from there and they were already doing agile stuff uh, like when i got to epa there was people like hiding in corners doing agile that, that people were telling was illegal um and 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 it was like, and so in the early days of it, this thing gets launched, and then I spend all my time like arguing with lawyers for the first six months. Is like Agile's legal, user centered design's legal. It's okay to use GitHub. It's not illegal. It's, you know, and we finally got through that hump, and then it was just, it's been a lot of fun for me to see the growth and the the adoption and, and things like that. So that was the start for me. And and uh, what about yourself though? Like, like it's probably, you were at an agency. Right? Like, what was... What? Well, I think it goes back further than that, right? So here I am, mild-mannered, you know, running a school district IT department. Right? Mm -hmm. And I get this phone call. Um, and, it, you know, it's it's so-and-so from the Office of Presidential Personnel. And, and I was about ready to hang up the phone until they mentioned <laughs> the name of someone I actually knew. And I'm like, oh, this really is the White House calling. Okay. And, and they were trying to, you know, they were working on a slate of CIOs for the second term. And they were looking for CIOs who were going to be innovative, right? You know, you sort of the first term is the people they owe favors to, right? And then the second term, they actually have to go out and find people. It doesn't mean that they didn't hire good people the first term, but they sort of knew who they were. Second term, you got to go look for them. So it was really clear immediately when I started that they wanted people who were going to change things and that the focus was, you know, this was right on the heels 
of, or even still in the midst of healthcare.gov, right? Because you think about it, uh, a lot of the stuff around healthcare.gov, they didn't want to tackle until after the election because they didn't want to you know, cause problems during the election. So a lot of that happened after the election. So they're ramping up, trying to figure out how to do that. It was starting to break. And they were looking for these CIOs. Um, so I got to EPA. And as you point out, there were people you know, going, shh, don't tell anybody you're doing this. right? So even I, after being, you'd, I've been at the EPA, I think, a year before you came in. OK. Um, I can't remember exactly. Do you remember when you came to EPA? It was like April of 2015. Yeah, so I've been there about six, six months then, not okay. even. OK. So um, You seemed settled in. Yeah, I was doing my Well, you don't, you know, as a presidential appointee, you're, you don't have a lot of time. Actually, during that time, six yeah. months was like an eternity. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I was so exhausted by the end of the administration. As anyone who's, who's been a political appointee will tell you, you just sprint. Um, but anyway, so we get in there, and um, it was very much mired in very traditional practices. And so we started talking as a CIO council about how we wanted to change things and talking about what's going on 18F and what's going on at USDS and how you know, there were incentives put in place um, by the various organizations for us to start implementing Agile. And we were started working through that in our organization. And we had a review with 18F of our proposed projects. And right. this guy shows up. Right. <clears throat> and uh, after the review is over, he sort of cornered me and said, uh, or maybe he cornered Stan, I can't remember who. But it's basically, hey, you know. No, I think I, it was you. I yeah. think it was you. You know, I hear you're hiring a CTO. I might be interested in coming over. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was interesting for me because at that moment, we had, we were, we were, when we were building 18F, we were building it before we were announced, right? So we were, we were picking projects and stuff that we were going to work on. And we had all of these creative people who were project team members that could turn project teams around. And we, we get to, and it was sort of like we were building for this battle, right? Like we built these teams that could turn projects around and, and people, there was all, everybody was questioning the methodologies and you couldn't do this. And there was these basic questions. Um, but really what happened is suddenly like we get announced and then it was like this floodgates of we want to work with you help. And I always equated it to like as we built a team that could like take a hill and we could take any hill. But what happens if at the top of the hill someone gives you the keys and says run the city, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of like I think any sort of revolution's problem is like what happens if you win, right? And then, and then all of a sudden it was like, whoa, I, what is that playbook, right? And um, so we, going and, and interviewing and, talk, and talking to you, like the thing that was motivating me is like we wanted to take 18F services, go into an agency and turn it around. And we did that through the US, US Digital Services who was placing teams and stuff like that. And as I was going on that tour of interviewing, I was looking for an early adopting agency. And the way you guys were speaking in that meeting, I was like, oh, this would be a very good place to try that. And that's, that's what sparked that. Yes, as we talked about, you know, I've talked about this a bunch of times, that, you know, USDS basically fought fires. Right. And 18F tried to build buildings and built buildings. Um, but the goal with the agencies was to teach people how to build buildings. Right. And so, you know, we create this, create this process even inside VPA where we brought in fellows from the outside, we brought in people from uh, the Office of Environmental Information, which was the main IT department. And then we put those folks into teams uh, along with the folks who were already in those teams. And we knew that the folks on those teams knew how the business worked. right? And the folks who were coming in knew IT or new digital services. And we tried to put them together so that when 18F walked away and when OEI walked away at the end of the project, those folks still knew what they were doing. Right. And, and you, you know, we did see some, some success in that space. I mean, you know, oh, yeah, it, was, it, was, I, it w was funny for me because there was like, part of me coming over, remember, it was like, we want you to go after this project, which was like the intervention project, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then they were, I was like, why don't we do the early adopter projects? They're like, no, no, dude. And I was like, this is going to be, people are going to hate me. They're going to be, and they, sure did. Enough, they did, they did. You go in and it was like the emails about me behind my back were just atrocious. And, yeah. uh, and, and you just, it was, and I kept saying, I was like, it's not a technology problem. What you're, what you're going to find is you have a workforce and a culture problem in this, de this department. It has nothing to do with the technology. And that same culture is going to attack me the minute I go over there. But on the flip side, we had these early adopters, right? And the thing that I always, this isn't a scientific study, but the thing that always struck me is I had a team of um, people from 18F, and we sent two of them over to one of the early adopters. And, and they sat with a team for eight weeks. And on the first week, the team that we sat them with was like, we're good. We're already doing Agile. 
And I was like, okay, just you know, have the team work with you and coach you through. And so this team sat on their team. And they get to uh, sprint. They're, they're in there. I guess it was like the third sprint. So they were coming towards the end of the sixth week. And um, all of a sudden, I get this excited call from the, the manager of the team. And he goes, we thought we knew what Agile was. <laughs> and I was like, ah. You, like, I didn't have to say you really weren't doing Agile. Yeah. You know, it was like they came to that discovery, and it was that model was so interesting because when they had the aha and they were so excited about it, he says, we're going to do this with our these now 10 projects, and we'll help manage it with your support. Flip over to the intervention side and just pitchforks and wanting to kill me and you know all these different things, and then all of a sudden, month three, we deploy. And something that they thought was going to take three years to deploy and get in production. And it just jaws dropped. And suddenly, they, all the anger and all that went away. And it was incredible. And then the very next thing that they said to me was like, we think we're on board this. We're going to try it one more time. And I always looked at that and was like, <laughs> a lot more effort to get one repeat over here. A little effort, and we got times 10, right? Like, yeah. you know, and, but you got to do both. But it was just interesting to see both balance in the, in the two different cultures. But it's always a, a cultural thing. Is a, is a group want to learn? Are they open? Are they empathetic? Or the other side? Well, in talking about cultures, I think one of the ahas in the turnaround project was about uh, user-centered design versus stakeholder centered oh, yeah. design, oh, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> You know, the story there, and I'll let you tell, tell most of it, was basically they were building the wrong product. Right. So you want to... You wanna... Well, it was, it, you know, I had no reason to believe that they were building the wrong product. It was just that we we're going to go through this process and see. And we get in there, and they're like, well, we don't need to do this. They spent most of their money, uh, and a company delivered them 800 requirements, right? And most of the money that was given to them by Congress was spent just to get to this 800 requirements. And getting, and, and they had 25 stakeholders who all had to agree in order for things to move forward. So it was things like button colors and, and like, you know, things like this. And so when I came in, I was like, we're now empowering the team to make the decisions. And um, the stakeholders can watch and they can contribute opinions and ideas, but you're not, the team's gonna be making the decisions going forward. And this, people were like losing their mind on that. But, um, and then, um, and, and so, Everyone's like freaking out. Well, you can't build this way. You can't police. You can't do all these different things. And what, what was interesting was like when they, the first thing the team did, which was the right thing, was like they went out. It was like to the Midwest, basically. Like we got to go meet the customers. And um, they went out and sat with the customers. And the customers were like, do not build a system or an interface for us. If you build an interface, we're going to lose our minds. We already have a digital interface for ourselves. We just need an API. And so all we had to do was build an API that could connect into their systems and pull their data in. And that was, at three months, we had live data to test because we just went that API route. So it's not like, people talk about waterfall, and agile, and like, it's like, it's not even a fair comparison because had we started with the 800 requirements, you would have ended up with totally different systems, right? We weren't really even building the same system from the beginning because we were engaged with the users. But that, that was enough that people were like, huh. And when we realized we could get 95% of the transactions in just through an API, you know, it was like, well, that's a lot easier than what was happening before. So um, and it was great. And then it got very positive and great after that three-month period. But Checking my notes for what else yeah, we're supposed to be the, talking about. <clears throat> maybe current state. Yeah, exactly. We're sitting up so, here so, pontificating you know, yeah, about so the past. past. Let's, so where are we now? <laughs> What's going on right now in your world? Or well, I, look, so there's a lot of things that I'm very encouraged on. I, I, first of all, it, you know, the language has changed. Like everybody's trying, is talking about agile, they're talking about human-centered design. Everybody's like driving towards this, and I find that awesome. Like that, that gets me very excited because that was not true when we started. It was literally battles over whether agile was legal to do in the government or whether you know it was these silly things now, but it was like very serious back then. And um, and so when I look at like the name change and stuff like that. It's, I'm very encouraged. It's come so far. And you have like almost every association affiliated with vendors inside government, particularly federal government, are now talking about digital services and, and what does that mean. What the, the challenge I have with it is I'm not so sure they all really understand it, right? And, and I think that most people took what they understood about IT management or, or IT services, but I, I use IT management on purpose because I feel like it's like the practices of IT management. They said, well, we'll just relabel them and call it digital services. And, <laughs> and it's really hard. You have to go through it to have that discovery. Like, oh, wait, this is fundamentally different. Like, 
DevOps is not configuration management and why, right? And what are those differences? And, and what, what's interesting to me is, and I try to explain it this way, and I ho hope it helps some people, is that, that digital services are really services in the digital era. And I think the challenge is when you think from an IT management standpoint, and you being a CIO, and, and there's a sense that like the IT department is shrinking. And, and, and going away, these are, these are now utilities and services and things you can turn on and connect into. And so what does that mean when we're talking about mission and program delivery? Not something historically that people who got into IT management thought of first, mm -hmm. but certainly makes sense if you think that we're really in the services industry, right? And so I think the next move is to, to scale the actual practice and not just the lingo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, yeah, I think that's where the federal government is. And you know, it's, it's, it's in spite of the bad rap this city gets sometimes, the federal government does a lot of really good things, right? And one thing the federal government has done is they're way ahead of state and local in a lot of cases uh, with Agile and moving Agile forward. So, uh, you know, as we were talking about recently, there's, there's actual, you, you might not believe this sometimes in an agency, but there's real value in having OMB or uh, another oversight agency say, thou shalt do this. Uh, because it gives CIOs tremendous power and leverage to get something done. Because you've got this big stick that's sitting back there. And, you know, I didn't use the stick much at EPA, but I had the stick back there because someone was telling me that this was the law and this required me to do something. At the local level, um, it's it's you know, at the state level, there's a little more going on in terms of governors saying do this, do that. Um, you don't see that at the local level. You don't see a CEO or a county executive or a uh, a, a city manager coming in saying, thou shalt go do Agile, um, or thou shalt go do digital services. Uh, so it really falls upon the CIOs, each individually, to drive that forward. And, um, you know, if you think federal procurement is bad, try state and local procurement, um, which was just shocking to me, right? Because, again, you don't have this big oversight bureaucracy, um, but what you do have is um, there seem to be a lot of chief procurement officers in state and local who are on a bit of a power trip, <laughs> you know, and, and they want to control everything uh, by, you know, I used to say at EPA, and, the, and no one at EPA would argue about this, that our HR and our procurement departments believed that their job was to keep us from breaking the law. I believe their job is to help you deliver and while you're at it, not break the law. And I'm experiencing that same thing, not with HR, actually. We're getting some great partnership from our HR team, but, but, I'm, but I'm seeing uh, a real focus on don't break the law at the local level and don't be an innovation is a secondary thing right and one of the things that that's real clear really clear to me is if you want to do digital services you have to do innovative procurement right they don't uh, yeah. they, they you can't they don't stand alone no it's true and well that was when i talked about like giving the keys to run the city right like and the thing that we'd set up but through uh, what was e enterprise for the environment mm -hmm. right at epa was what what i had access to was all the CXOs were the cross-functional team. And so we would go through, you could imagine going through the list of what are the roadblocks. And it wasn't just lost in space. It was that CXO's responsibility to get that roadblock out of the way. And, and that was managed um, really by Stan Myberg, who, who, was, who was our deputy administrator. Awesome guy, taught me a ton about like how to run large organizations. Stan's and, amazing. Stan's incredible. And, and, and he taught me about, um, what is it? I, my, one of my favorite like lessons was uh, cooperative federalism. Remember that one? Yes. And and, um, and it's a real thing. You can look it up. It actually has a Wikipedia <laughs> entry into it. But um, it, it it's the way to run an organization. And as I read about it, it mirrored agile. It mirrored lean practices. And I was like, wow, you guys are struggling with the same thing. And so we we pulled together that team, and we got, and and then with the Fatara Authority, right. You, which, you know, you could go back and forth on whether Fatara was correctly written or not, like that. but the authority was great, right? Like, we, we killed tons of governance boards and like, stuff like that. So it, that, that enterprise level change, you know, was, was fabulous, so. Yeah, so EPA was generally a compliant place, so Fatara really was, a, was the uh, tool we had to leverage. Another, another, and this is sort of a rel off topic, but I'll say another Stan Mybergism, which is probably helpful, <laughs> is uh, if you're going to offend on content, don't offend on form. Uh, and I think we offended on content a great deal at times, so we tried not to offend on form too okay. much. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, we, we he really did help us break a lot of a lot of eggs. So, so we got time. okay, we got time. We got time. We got time. So, so okay, you have a question? Well, I just yeah. marketplace. I, yeah, we that's talked, where I was going. We talked before, yeah. and I and I wanted to jump into it because for me, it's from the beginning. 
doing innovation and acquisition and then leading to 18F and then um, and looking at procurements and stuff like that, well, the other side of that is like a, a marketplace and, and fundamentally a, like a broken marketplace, right? Where um, a, as I talk to government agency leads, even today, and a tremendous frustration as to why we can't get delivery of services to, to any high quality level. And, and this person's doing it over here and there's examples of it over there, but what's wrong with the marketplace? And, and, and we can spend a whole day talking about that. And I, there's blame on both sides. Like I would always say, you know, if you're government and you're buying something for 40 years and you're unhappy about it, well, you know, you gotta, why do you keep buying it that way? Um, and, and, but, but secondarily, like, it's like, there's a lot of, uh, vendors and people who are who become entrenched they, they got into the same habits and they got into the same things and they reinforced well this and, and the way they reinforce is from an economic standpoint they look at it and they say well this is a barrier to entry right and um and so if we can create it's, it's almost like lots of associations form and the companies that form them they say let's create a barrier to entry for anybody else so that we can protect the work for ourselves and i i understand that from sort of a how to do business development for fields, right? I understand that from like a selfish, you know, standpoint, but it's not good for the government. It's not good for the country. So like AGL, you know, one of the things that we think about, it would be great to see AGL get, uh, grow in some advocacy, right? And particularly in the marketplace discussion. And I would also like to think that us vendors and everybody a part of it is we espouse to like welcoming in the new companies and making it as easy as possible and breaking down those barriers. And uh, so I'm excited to see like, incredible growth of like digital service, like human-centered design, agile companies delivering, and there's all sorts of examples proliferating across DOD, like DOD's doing some amazing things with like Kessel Run, and Bespin, and all these things. Um, but there's not just groups that are named, right? Like we, everybody talks about the 18F, US Digital Services, and all these digital services. The, the reality is either you multiply that by 100, and there's groups that are essentially digital service groups that have formed, they just haven't called themselves something. And um, those groups are really exciting because it's, they're all trying to practice the same thing and get the, the same thing, but they're also all trying to get out to a marketplace. And as I've looked at the different companies, the demand for the services of the companies that would be in a community like this is through the roof right now. It is just, it's, a, it's at a desperate level from the, the, the buyer's standpoint, the government's perspective. And that's a fantastic thing. It's fascinating to see how low the demand is on the other side with all the other companies that don't necessarily practice this way who are now trying to go, well, if that's where the demand is, how do I change my behavior to get there? And this is a good thing, but I think for that to continue and scale, many of us have to grow, right? And then a new generation of companies need to come in and we need to start taking on bigger contracts and scale it. So I'd like to see a more aggressive approach in the marketplace to not just have satellites of awesomeness going on, but how do we just take over a whole agency and do it? But yeah, like, yeah. I think, you know, we we trained vendors for many years, you know, get a seven-year contract or, 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 you know, six, or one year with six one-year options, right? Keep, you know, keep doing that over and over again. Um, and so we're retraining them as to how to work. And we've retrained some of them at the federal level. And we've built, we, we've grown new startups at the federal level as well. You know, your company is relatively new. There's a lot of small companies out there who embrace this. Certainly early on, you know, the, 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 the uh, vendors were almost a barrier to our ability to move forward. And, and at the state and local level, um, there are many fewer vendors who get this. Uh, so we don't, you know, I don't get the, the big consulting firms that, that deal with the federal government or the big services firms that deal with the federal government knocking on my door when I have a contract. They're, they're not really interested, even though, you know, my agency is the size of, of, of EPA. So really, there's probably some places where they should be interested in state and local government, um, but they're not. And, uh, and, the, and the small startups haven't sort of taken the wherewithal for the most part to come out to the West Coast. They're probably doing some stuff regionally. So I think there's a huge void um, in state and local of vendors who are prepared to function in the Agile environment. And we're putting together what we would call an Agile BPA at the federal level. So it's going to be really interesting when we start trying to buy sprints. Uh, whether the vendors that are on our BPA sort of, or want to be on our BPA sort of look at us like we've grown a second head. Right. Um, so that's going to be a really interesting development because the only way I can do anything fast is the same way in the federal government, which is build yourself a contract where you can acquire, once you've competed that, you can acquire stuff quickly. So our next move is an agile uh, vehicle for that because we have a, right now we have a small but growing internal team doing agile, uh, but we don't have the tools 
to to leverage that. And, you know, and the, it's a little different at state and local in terms of what you need to develop because unlike the federal government where the customer base for many things is one, you, whatever agency you are, there's one, you're the only one who need that product. Right. Uh, there's a lot of overlap at state and local, but there are plenty of things that are unique that we need people to help us develop and build. So anything else you want to hear or should we take a question or two? Uh, we can take a question or two. There are, if anyone has any. If there's no questions, we'll... We can keep talking Unfair. for hours. Oh, yeah. Hold on, Mark's got the mic. Hold on. Big mouth. I don't think it's going to work. Um, in terms of your experiences with looking at different ways to build software and systems, and you see this increasing interest in scaled agile development, ways of building things, specifically, say, Dean Leffingwell's vision of scaled agile and other forms of scaled agile. What do you see a year, two years down the road in terms of how rapidly is the federal government going to start adopting and moving towards, say, for other forms of scaled agile? We see that in DOD already, Homeland Security and other agencies, but across government, do you see a real serious focus on moving those processes for software and systems development towards scaled agile, or is it mostly just lip service? Um, I, you know, I think um, so the short answer is yes, I do see it, it, it driving in that direction, but it's a little bit different. I, I, and it might be because I just view it slightly differently. Um, when we were trying to figure out how at the enterprise do you manage your portfolio, right? Um, historically, the, and, and, it, and it's a fine word, but it's just gotten a bad name, but you would, you would have a program off. Right, program management office that sits somewhere in your organization. And the reason it got a bad name is because they essentially became like barely compliance. I don't know what you would call it. It was it. a roadblock. It was, it was a roadblock that was like would put things up on the wall, yeah. you know. And um, you and, must do this to move forward. Yeah, and this is, you know, we went, for, for example, like when I got to, to EPA, I kept being told, well, we follow lean, you know, and we do lean across our portfolio. And I was like, awesome. I love Lean. This is fabulous. We're going to get along. And then I was like, how do you measure your process? And they were like, what, what are you talking about? We don't measure our process. So I was like, well, I don't know how you could do Lean without measuring your process. Well, what is your process? Like, What's the value? I, they would look at me like, I, the value of what? And I was like, your service. They're like, we don't really consider ourselves a service. You know? and, and, and I was like, what, how is... How is this Six Sigma? Like, you know, like, how is this allowed, right? And so, and and so, what, what, what I was talking to because there were so many things that needed to change, like there was like Toyota Lean thinking and, and and continuous improvement, but there were so many things that needed to change. We were focused on like Lean startup, and where I kind of where we came to was like there is a value set of Agile, right, that needs to be enforced across the whole program. Otherwise, everything is siloed. Your money comes in silo, it asks permission, the department keeps it and you keep the silo. So the way you break that down is not to add a really thick, hard level of another of a strong portfolio management office, but agile at scale, some way that you can thinly and, and I and I you know reinforce those behaviors. So for example, we were talking about a new software governance board shouldn't allow a consideration of software unless they brought two customers to the table who wanted to use it. And that you then, that was a designation of there's a customer who's going to tell you what the value is, be part of the test, and if it proves value, then congratulations, it's new software that gets added. And we'll allow the pilot immediately, not wait for some long you know, bureaucratic process. So when I think of like Agile at scale, and I hope I'm answering this correctly, but I think that there's some processes that are Agile at scale, and this is my opinion, that have gotten a little full of themselves and have kind of made all sorts of bells and whistles at the top, when really it's like best practices across the board. Who were your customers that said this was right? Like who, who was the user that said this was right? And just reinforcing that. And I think there's many good practices of Agile at scale that will get adopted. But there, I know there's many like I, you know, Agile purists who argue with me on this. And they'll say, no, we just need to have independent Agile teams delivering and, and, and all this. Stuff. And I get where they're coming from. but. You know, if you have a large organization, you are an organization because generally there is a common mission, and someone needs to make sure those resources are aligned and working towards a common mission. And that means taking what is siloed budget and governance 
and at the delivery level, making sure there's reuse and things are being shared where it makes sense. So you intercept it at that de delivery level right above those teams. It doesn't mean that the Agile teams aren't empowered. And there's some agencies right now that are sort of taking, like Agile at scale isn't about delivery. It, it, to me, it's, it's more about like, well, how do you, you align not how you take delivery away from the teams of the, you know, I hope I'm answering it somewhat okay for you. Yeah, I think that, you know, the challenge, right, in a big organization of scale, to your point is, you've got to figure out how to scale in a way that, that doesn't disempower those teams, but still creates some level of governance because big organizations live for governance, so live for control and live for structure because they don't want to have chaos. And Agile, in and of itself is a little bit of chaos. It, you know, it, it lives for being slightly chaotic. Now, see here, I would argue with her that Agile is a very disciplined <laughs> methodology. And it's, well, the, <laughs> methodolo the methodology is disciplined, but in an organization that you It's often to, not practiced in a disciplined way. How about that? Well, no, let me get my, I'm going to get the last word in here. So it's disciplined. It's practiced in a disciplined way, but, but it looks chaotic to the outside organization yes. because there's no well-defined plan. Right, you you you're going to work off your backlog, and you're going to change what you're doing because otherwise you're not doing it right. Right. All right, I got the last word. Hey. Hey, we better get out of here. Um, let's give Ann and Greg a big round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs>